Okay, uh, so uh, today I'm gonna present a case uh, with the chief complaint of abdominal pain and altered mental status. Actually, one second. Guys, uh, just whoever has seen lab at four, uh, just remember to log off a little bit earlier so that you can be at the same lab at four in time. Um, otherwise, I will forget to tell you, but sorry, Jin, you can start again, sorry. Um, so the chief complaint is abdominal pain and altered mental status. Uh, for this patient, a history of, uh, the history of present illness, so he's a 79 year old gentleman. He has a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type two diabetes and CKD, although we don't have his baseline labs. And also have history of hypothyroidism, obesity with BMI over 35. So he initially presented to the ED with abdominal pain and altered mental status. And he was a limited historian due to his mental status. And so uh, back then in the ED, they called his primary care physician uh, to obtain more information. So one day before his admission, he called his primary care physician with complaint of generalized abdominal pain for hours. And back then he rated as seven out of 10. And he was initially advised to come to the ED the day before, but he was hesitant about it. And later on, he was found by EMS that he was altered, ended up on the floor in his own apartment. And also back then, he was found to be hypoxic uh, with 90% auto-saturation on room air. And uh, in the ED, his auto-saturation improved on four liters of nasal cannula to 97%. And uh, he initially uh, denied any history of alcohol use when he was more lucid back then. And then he quickly decompensated and uh, could not provide any more history. He ended up becoming AO times one, only to his name, not to time or location. And for his past medical history, um, he had no known allergies. And for his past medical history, we got the information from his primary care physician because uh, he had no record in Epic or Care Everywhere. So he had uh, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, hypothyroidism, and obesity, and no previous surgical history. Um, for his social history, he had the history of tobacco use, but he already quit smoking cigarette, and he's an occasional drinker and denied history of illegal drug use. And so he's been living alone since retirement after his wife passed away, and uh, he was fully functional before this admission. And he had no recent travel history and no sick contact recently. And for his home medications, he takes amlodipine, valsartan, conjoint pills, and he also takes uh, chlorothaladone for his hypertension, and also he takes a high intensity rosuvastatin, phenofibrate, icosapen for his hyperlipidemia. And for his diabetes, he takes meformin, 500 milligram BID and citagliptin one tap daily. He also takes levothyroxine 50 daily and uh, also eye drops as well. Before we go to the vitals or any other, does anyone else have questions or anything you want to ask before we go more in the physical and the vitals of the patient? I guess a question I had, if there's any change in his medications recently, dosing or anything new from his medication list? So uh, from his MATRAC record, um, all the medications were Home medication that he's been taking for month, for months before this admission, um, but uh, we never got in touch with uh, his PCP after the initial admission. So uh, we assume there was no new recent medication change. Okay. Uh, and then in the chat, there's a couple of questions. Does he have ADLs and IADLs or any home health? Um, he doesn't have home health aid at home. Okay, um, any family friends to have more collateral information? So he has the, the only relative in the world is his sister and uh, the team called his sister for update and some more information during the hospitalization. 
So um, she helped with uh, some of the social history and uh, travel history as well. Okay. Um, and then recent um, heavy drinking since it's occasional a drinker. Um, he denied alcohol, and uh, later when we go when uh, when we go over his labs, we can see that uh, his alcohol level is actually negative. Okay. Any diarrhea? Uh, he had no diarrhea during admission. Okay. And no, I guess like no history of diarrhea before the admission. Uh, he had no history of diarrhea, but uh, later during the hospital course, he did develop diarrhea. Okay. Um, Sammy is asking if he's reliable to actually take the medications regularly. Um, we did not get to assess the compliance with his home medications, but uh, he's been keep picking up his medications regularly before admission. Okay. Any seizure history? No history of seizure. Any history of CAD? Um, we don't think there was history of CAD. It, uh, from his primary care physician, there was no uh, information for that. Okay, and then Sammy is asking any cough, shortness of breath, or infectious sign? Uh, we did not, uh, we can go over his review of system. That, uh, we didn't get to do a formal uh, review of system because of his alter mental status, but he didn't have presentations like cough, shortness of breath, um, he did. He was tachypneic and hypoxic during um, during admission, but there was no like active complaint of shortness of breath. Okay. And the last question from Cheryl: uh, Mental status of baseline? He was uh, fully functional before the submission, so there was a sudden change, of, a sudden deterioration of his mental status initially. Um, any surgical history? No history of surgeries. And then uh, any oxygen requirement at home? He was not on home oxygen, no history of lung disease. Okay, okay. So maybe let's see uh, if we find out something else from your slides. Okay. Uh, so for his review of system, we did not get to obtain because his mental status changed, but uh, it was significant for um, abdominal pain. He could not verbalize localization, quantity, the quality or severity of his abdominal pain, but we can elaborate more on that during the physical exam. Uh, exam uh, there's a couple of more questions. Um, so they're asking if he had any previous colonoscopy that you know? Uh, we did not see any history of uh, colonoscopy, uh, any record for that. And then Tom is asking, you said no diarrhea, but did he have any constipation? Uh, we did not get to um, ask these sort of questions during initial admission because he was altered. Okay, okay, you can go on. So for his vitals, initially he was, um, he had a fever with a temperature of 40.7 Celsius and 100.105 Fahrenheit. And he was tachycardic with heart rate of 116, 116, and he was tachypneic. Respiratory rate was 26, and uh, his blood pressure initially was fine, 137 over 60. But then he gradually went down to 90 over 57. And uh, he was well saturated on 40 thirds of nasal cannula, but he was not on any oxygen at home and desaturated when he's off of nasal cannula. And for his physical exam, um, the significant part was um, he had, uh, he appeared jaundice. He had jaundice, ectoric sclera. And also for his abdominal exam, he was grunting during the deep palpation of right upper quadrant. So he had right upper quadrant abdominal pain, but it was soft. There was no guarding and uh, there was negative Murphy sign and decrease, and he had decreased bowel sound. Okay. And uh, for his cardiovascular exam, he was okay. Respiratory rate, respiratory exam, it was clear to ask the patient bilaterally and no wheezing, and, but he was tachypneic. And the other exam, he had no rash, he had no, uh, he had no edema, clubbing, cyanosis, and peripheral limbs were well, were warm and well perfused. And uh, back then he was agitated and AO times one uh, for his neurological exam. Perfect. So before we move on, um, anyone has any questions now that we have the physical and the, <clears throat> and the vitals? Uh, 
I, I actually had a question about the icteric sclera. Um, is that something new that he has done this? I don't know if when you talked to the PCP, he told you anything about jaundice? Uh, he did not mention anything regarding that, but it was a finding during the ED when he was in the ED. Okay, and then Juan is asking if you guys did a DRE. Um, I don't think they did DRE in the ED. It was not, there was no concern of uh, GI bleeding back then. Okay, any epigastric tenderness? Uh, it was right upper quadrant during the palpation, but there was no concern of epigastric pain back then. And then Emily is asking any polymer erythema, spider mangiomas. I think she wants to know if there's any possibility of cirrhosis. Uh, there was no finding regarding that, and uh, there's no history of liver disease. And then Patricia is asking any sexual history? Uh, he was not sexually active after his wife passed away. Um, Bruno wants to know if there's any previous abdominal pain at any point, according to the primary doctor. Um, I don't think there was any history for that. It was only during the initial presentation. Um, the team called his primary care physician about, the, um, about that abdominal pain. And his primary care physician told the team that he called him a day before admission that he was having this acute abdominal pain. But okay. there was no like history of follow up for that. Okay. So any, before we, yeah, sorry, uh, Tyler, go on. Any surgical scars on the abdomen? Uh, there was no surgical history or scarring. Okay. So before we move on, um, just very quickly, um, I just wanted to kind of like discuss a little bit with you what's happening here because I think we do have a lot of like useful information already. Um, and I think I'm sure any of you, when you have a patient that's, you know, it's like an elderly male, he has so many comorbidities, but from the physical and the vitals, we, I think, have a lot of information that can help us in our differential diagnosis. And specifically, I think we know that he has acute abdominal pain because he said that yesterday the pain started. And from the physical exam, it sounds like it's more a right upper quadrant pain. Then we also know that he has a fever. So we will put that there because it's important in our differential. Um, we also know that he has jaundice. I don't think we clearly know if that's a new or an old thing. I don't know if we really know a lot from this primary doctor, but that's also an important finding. Uh, we also know that he's altered and he's hypoxic. And then I actually think that the gene said that at one point he becomes also hypotensive. So at one point we will also have hypotension here. Um, so if we put these things together, we, what do we have? I think we already have three important things, rapid quadrant pain, fever, exactly. So we already have the renal pentad and the Charcot triad, which would tell us technically that he has what, like what do we think when we have this type of like symptoms together? What, acute phalangitis, perfect. Perfect. So I think if we're building the differential, we are definitely thinking about acute phalangitis in this patient. Um, but then also, we always have to be kind of broad. We don't have to like fixate on one thing. So what other things you guys um, can think of might actually be associated with? Okay, so acute liver injury. Perfect, Victor. So any type of like acute hepatitis, uh, I don't know, from viral um, causes, but even toxic. Uh, can cause these three symptoms and signs, liver abscess. Definitely not very frequent, but absolutely can cause pain, fever, and jaundice, and then signs of sepsis. Um, anything else that we need to consider? Pancreatitis, absolutely, because usually that's associated with any of these, you know, acute cholangitis or other like biliary issues that might kind of cause any blockage. Acute cholecystitis, Yes, I agree that we have to put this here. And um, I know that, sorry, I was writing cholangitis. Um, I know that um, Jean said that we do not have a Murphy sign, that the Murphy sign is negative. Uh, but the Murphy sign, uh, it's actually very sensitive. So technically when we have it, we kind of, uh, and we, when we don't have it, we kind of think, okay, this patient does not have acute cholecystitis because it can be 
sensitive up to 97%. Uh, the specificity is very low. So when we have it, we don't know if it's actually to cholecystitis, but the sensitivity actually decreases with, uh, with age. So older patients might not have Murphy sign, even if they have acute cholecystitis. And the other issue might be that the patient is really altered in our case. So I wouldn't use Murphy sign to 100% rule out acute cholecystitis from just a physical exam. Um, and I guess like another thing, it's maybe more rare, but Chiari, um, which is basically the thrombosis of the, of the venous, um, the hepatic veins can cause congestion and can cause sometimes even fever, pain, and jaundice. Um, and then I would just put this here, pneumonia, just because we are not 100% sure about the jaundice being a new thing or an old thing. Um, yeah, so, at the minimum, so we could even split those two things and have maybe hemolysis and then infection. Uh, so that's also something, especially because the patient is hypoxic. Um, and so I guess like if you want to do a workup, what are we all curious to know now? If we're already in labs, Yeah, so the, as Dr. Andrew said, Murphy sign is not very, like, 100% great to just tell us about your cholecystitis. So we need to be very cautious to just say, okay, it has cholecystitis, it doesn't, depending on the Murphy sign. Um, okay, CBC, BMP, LFTs. So I think that's something perfect. Did this study slide base LFTs? And then imaging, right, for quadrant ultrasound. Perfect. I think if we already get this, we have a lot to kind of like work on. Um, and before we find out about the labs, um, okay, so UA, I think UA is important also, uh, but there's one thing that you guys didn't tell me that I want to know. So this patient is altered. We don't know. We're, tell, we're saying that he might have acute hepatitis, so we need to know if he's intoxicated. So that's another thing that you will want to see. Ammonia, but also even like a classical, you know, uh, Tylenol level, like acetaminophen level, ESH. Um, <laughs> the tangier say no ammonia. Uh, yeah, so usually ammonia is not really correlated with the um, with altered mental status. We don't really even kind of track it, but it's something that we do in the hospital, so uh, we, we kind of check it to be honest. But yeah, um, and the UTOC. Um a chest X-ray. Absolutely agree. We need to see if there's any pneumonia causing all of these symptoms too. Um, and when we get the LFTs, um, what do we look? usually at to kind of like help us in our differential diagnosis. Like we have an ALT, AC, um, ACFOS, directly, exactly. So, and usually we kind of want to see what pattern the LFTs have to see if it's more from the livers, from, from the biliary system, if it's a mix. So usually if it's a very, very high ALT, AC compared to the bilirubin and the ACFOS will think it's more hepatocellular damage versus if it's alcohol and bilirubin, it's more like a cholestatic problem and it can be mixed. Um, and then sometimes it's very difficult because they're all similar. So a way that we can uh, actually calculate and help us differentiate an hepatocellular versus a mixed versus a um, cholestatic pattern is to calculate something called R value or R factor. Uh, and the way we do that, we use the ALT of the patient and we use the ALT because that's much more specific to the liver compared to the AST that we can find in other organs, uh, divided by the upper limit of normal of the ALT, which should be around 33 for men. And then we divide this by the ACFOS of the patient and the upper limit of normal ACFOS. If this value is more than five or equal to five, then we know it's more from the liver, so it's that hepatocellular. If it's less than two, then it's a cholestatic issue. If it's between the two, then it's a mixed pattern, okay? Um, so now let's go back to the case. Um, you can uh, resume your, your screen sharing and let's see what happened to the patient first. Um, now we can go over his labs. <laughs> 
Um, so initially, he presented with leukocytosis with white count of 23.6, and uh, he was mildly anemic, hemoglobin 12.2, MCV normal 90, and neutrophil was 90% initially. And for his chemistry panel, he has normal uh, electrolytes, and BUN was 52, creatinine was 2.779, and the estimate GFR was 21, although we didn't have a baseline of his labs. And for his level panel, AST elevated 316, ALT 203, direct bilirubin 4.3, total bilirubin 15.1, and ALKFOS was 332, and albumin was 2.6. His lipid panel, um, triglyceride normal 137, total cholesterol 57. Um, for his other labs, in, um, lipase was significantly elevated 9,388. And troponin was negative, uh, was mildly elevated initially, trended up to one peak at 1.085, and HPA1C was 6.3%. For his coax, INR 1.6, APTT 28.2, PT 18.6, and his VBG initially pH 7.37, it went down to 7.22, and PCO2 went up to 50, and bicarb went down to 20.5, and lactate was trending up initially 2.6, and it went up to 3.5. And there's more labs on the second page. Before we go to those, anyone has, I don't know, questions or thoughts? Uh, after what we said, are you now leaning towards one diagnosis versus another um, amongst the one that we were talking about earlier? I think yeah. the patient could be septic, absolutely. So you already know that he has fever, he's tachycardic, tachypneic, and he has leukocytosis. So he definitely has SIRS and he might have a source uh, given the pain in the right upper quadrant area. And then yeah, Bruno, I agree. We do have two out of three criteria for acute pancreatitis because he has abdominal pain. Even if it's not epigastric, he's, he's really altered. Um, and then we have light pace elevation three times more than normal. So he might have pancreatitis. Yeah, definitely going up. Um, and then, so quality is, so definitely when we have pancreatitis, we need to figure out if the quality is one of the cases it causes. Um, so, all good thoughts. My face is high, absolutely. Um, another thing, like albumin is low, um, and I think in these cases, I mean, at least what I'm like, whenever we check for LFTs, especially if you're thinking there's something acutely happening in the liver, we also have to look at the synthesis, uh, you know, ability of the liver, which is usually the albumin and the coagulase, um, the INR specifically. So a low albumin can be concerning, uh, and usually that means that the liver is actually not working for quite a while. And that's because albumin has a half-life for around three weeks. So usually you need more time for the liver not to be able to produce albumin. So if that was the case, that might be why. Um, on the other side, the patient has CKD, we don't know if he has necrosis. So maybe he's losing albumin that we don't really know uh, right now. Emily saying, I think we should also think of mass. Absolutely. Uh, and could be called some pancreatitis relation. Exactly. I think these are all good things. Um, okay. So. We, we do need more tests at this point, and um, so we'll see what Jean did with his team. For more of his labs, um, we have hepatitis viral panel, which came back negative, and also we have a utox panel that was mostly negative, and the benzodiazepine was positive because he received a lorazepam during, before the lab draw. So we think that that's the reason why it came back positive, but he was not taking any benzodiazepines at home. And he has negative acetaminophen level and negative alcohol level. Also salicylate level is negative as well. And for his UA, it was negative for nitrous and leukocyte asterase. Okay, so before we move on, does anyone wanna try a problem representation? We have a lot of information, we can go over it together to try and put together everything that you think is very important for us to have a differential diagnosis. Who wants to give a try? Sidra, back... would you like to give a try? Who? Sidra. Oh, Sidra, okay. I'm picking people whose cameras are off. And maybe, Jean, if you wanna go back to some of the slides so people can like use um, you know, the text to help themselves. 
Are you there, Sidra? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Can I volunteer you? Yeah. Um, you. We're just going to go over the most important information so far to put together our differential diagnosis. Uh, to give a differential or go over the information? You know, like our former presentation, basically what we do is uh, kind of um, see what the pa who's the patient, what it's coming with, and if there's any comorbidities, or in this case, we already have, you know, vital physical exam and labs. So what you think is, you know, relevant um, when is basically when you're writing your assessment, right? So what do you do? You put together the most important things that you believe might be like, kind of able to give you then a differential diagnosis. Um, so, for example, if, if this patient is 79, so it's going to be like an elderly male, right? So he's an elderly male, so that's his, who he is. He has a lot of comorbidities that sometimes you're going to have to like repeat. Sometimes we put together just the ones that we think are relevant for this case. So he has like diabetes, and I think we didn't mention, but he's taking Genuvia, which technically is as I see the clipping, is actually associated with pancreatitis. So that might be something relevant that we want to like remember. Right. Um, so we're going to say all these, uh, you know, um, past medical history that we think is important. So what is he presenting with? So he's presenting with abdominal pain. What's the um, um, tempo of the abdominal pain? Yeah, so we have like an elderly male presenting with severe generalized abdominal pain, um, has a septic pic picture with, um, you know, fever, leukocytosis, um, has a lipase elevation, um, as well as, you know, icteric sclera, high bilirubin, um, and also comorbidities of um, diabetes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the only thing I will add is that it's an acute onset, and usually I mean, at least from the exam that we have, it's more right after quadrant pain, and that can just help us in our mind to kind of differentiate where the pain is and what organs might be involved. But absolutely. So, an elderly male with all this past medical history coming with an acute onset of right, so abdominal pain um, and ultra mental status um, found to be septic with hypoxia, leukocytosis, um, a mixed pattern transaminides, elevated late pain. So, that's kind of like what summarizing the case. Um, and that will help us think about, you know, pancreatitis, as we said, acute cholangitis, um, maybe a mass, as Amy said. Victor is asking if we have a finger stick. Oh, we did have finger stick on this patient. I think it was mildly elevated, a hundred something. But back then we did not uh, concern that it was related to his um, diabetes or hyperglycemia. So okay. I didn't put it in the slide. Definitely important. Sometimes DKA, even though yes, type two, but DKA sometimes can present and you think the patient has pancreatitis or an acute abdomen and it's actually only DKA. I mean, only, but it's actually DKA. Uh, okay, let's let's continue with um, what happened to the patient. I think someone had asked for a record for the ultrasound. Oh, so this is his problem representation. And next slide, we can go over his ED, uh, his other imaging and other tests in the ED. So for his chest x-ray, it shows bilateral lower lobe linear atelectasis versus scarring, but there was no focal consolidation, pleural effusion, or pneumothorax. And for his ECG, it showed red bundle branch block. We don't have previous ECG, so didn't know it was new or not. Um, there was no significant ST elevation, ST segment change. And uh, we did do a liver ultrasound. It shows cholelithiasis without sonographic features of col acute cholecystitis, hepatomegaly with probable hepatic steatosis, echogenic right kidney, no discrete sonographic evidence of pancreatitis, main portal vein pattern with normal direction of flow. And they also commented that uh, there was no CBD dilation. It was measured 0.4 centimeters in diameter. And uh, because there was concern of falls, so we did a CT head. There was no evidence of intracranial hemorrhage, acute territorial infection, mass effect, or hydrocephalus. So we don't know yet. Okay. Oh, we, so, we also did a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast. For his liver, it showed multiple subcentimeter hypodensities, but they were too small to characterize. And for his biliary, there was mild intrahepatic biliary duct dilation, no dilatation of the common bile duct, 
Uh, for his gallbladder, there was cholelithiasis without surrounding inflammatory change. For his pancreas, there was fatty atrophy, punctate calcification within the pancreas. There was no definite findings suggestive of acute pancreatitis. For his bowel, no dilated loop of bowels to suggest obstruction. And for vessels, it was normal and the SMA was patent. Um, thank you. That, thank you, Dr. Anjali, for sharing the proper representation so you guys can go over it. Um, I guess like uh, this CAT scan doesn't really tell us still what's happening because it's kind of ruling out some of the things, even though still pancreatitis, I think, doesn't really need imaging to be diagnosed. So we cannot say that the patient does not have pancreatitis, but doesn't tell us why the patient has pancreatitis, I'd say. He might have, yeah, absolutely. But then the lipase is really, really high. So that looks like there's something also acute, but definitely he might have a chronic status because of the calcifications. Um, and before we move forward, uh, just really quickly, uh, I wanted to go over with you um, because the only thing that the CAT scan shows is actually that there's some hypodensities in the liver. So I just wanted to discuss a little bit about, you know, what do we do um, when we find um, a liver lesion, okay? So let's say that you are, uh, having a patient and you do an imaging for other reason, can be an ultrasound, can be a CAT scan, and then you find a liver lesion. So what's the first step that we have to think about in these patients? Because we need to kind of rule out important thing. Look at previous imaging, absolutely. So we're saying here it's a new one. So let's say the patient had nothing before. Um, we, wh what do we need to do to kind of rule out the most important, the most serious thing? We need to kind of rule out cancer. So like what can be like life-threatening for the patient. And um, to do that, usually we need to look for, you know, risk factors for cancer. And for liver cancer, the most important risk factor is, you all know it, I'm 100% sure that you do. Colon cancer. Yeah, so colon cancer is a risk factor because it can definitely cause um, metastasis, which are the most frequent kind of cancer of the liver. But if we're talking about the primary cancer than cirrhosis. So we need to look for any risk factor that the patient, the patient might have for cirrhosis. Uh, as Patricia is saying, so history of hepatitis C, alcohol, um, hepatitis B, um, age. So any type of risk factor that the patient might have cirrhosis and maybe it's not diagnosed yet. Uh, and then since as Debbie and Matthew were saying, there's also the problem of metastasis to the liver see if there's symptoms of possible cancer, like, I don't know, like weight loss, or if the patient has a history of prior cancer, then now maybe it's metastasizing. Um, remember that if we have a prior cancer and there's a new liver mass, that's a metastasis until proven otherwise. So if you have a patient with a liver lesion and any of these things are a yes for you or might be a yes, then you really need to um, investigate more to make sure there's no cancer. The good thing about liver lesions is that a lot of them can be actually accurately diagnosed only with imaging because of how the contrast kind of gets in the lesion and is washed out from the lesion. So radiology will kind of tell you most of the times. Um, and we can use two tests, either the triple phase CAT scan, which is um, basically called triple phase because the, the enhancement goes first in the arterial um, phase, then you have a portal venous phase, and then you have an hepatic venous phase. So depending on how the mass takes in and washes out the contrast in these three phases, radiology can tell us most of the times a diagnosis. Uh, or you can use MRI with contrast, and usually you will need kind of radiology to help you with the specific uh, setting that they need to do for the MRI. There can be like some specific liver settings for the MRI with contrast. So let's say that we are thinking about cancer we can have then HCC, which is primary liver cancer. Um, and we said that cirrhosis is very important. Actually, 80% of patients that have HCC will have cirrhosis. So that's why we need to rule it out. And that's why patients with cirrhosis go over with the surveillance every six months. They actually have a right upper quadrant ultrasound. And if there's a mass that's more than one centimeters, or if they have an increase of the half of fetal protein, they need to go and do a CT scan or an MRI because most of the times that mass will be actually uh, HCC. And you do not need a biopsy. Most of the times imaging will be enough for diagnosis. Then you can have cholangiocarcinoma, definitely less common. 
which can be intra or extra hepatic. And cholangiocarcinoma has very different risk factors, actually. One of them is uh, primary sclerosis cholangitis, and usually within two years of the diagnosis of PSC, you can have a high chance of cholangiocarcinoma, despite that there's no routine screening recommended. And other risk factors may be alcohol, smoking, or history of liver fluke. And then, of course, we have metastasis. So the metastases are the most frequent. And usually, actually, before we move there, so cholangiocarcinoma, usually you will actually need tissue for a diagnosis. So if the patient has a, a small cancer that can be resected, you will actually go directly to surgery, resect everything, and then see what's the diagnosis to avoid you know, dissemination of the, of the cancer. If the cancer is too disseminated, you will actually do a biopsy and then treat the patient when possible. Uh, metastasis. Usually, imaging is also kind of tells you if it's a metastasis, especially if patients have a primary cancer. So that will depend on the picture specifically for the patient. Usually, you do not really biopsy metastasis in the liver. The diagnosis is from radiology, from the history of the patient. We have other very rare cancers like androsarcoma, but I don't think we need to know a lot about them. Let's say that everything here is a no. So we have no suspicion that the patient might have cancer then we really need to see what the ultrasound is telling us because most of the time a liver lesion will be found on an ultrasound that we are doing for other reason. And the ultrasound is very good at distinguishing a, a solid mass versus like a cystic mass. So we might have like solid lesions, we might have cysts. Or the third option, which usually the ultrasound will tell us, is a hemangioma. So usually the ultrasound already can tell us if the lesion is a hemangioma. And the hemangioma is actually the most common benign lesion of the liver. So that's going to be something that you can find in patients incidentally. So it's the first uh, most common lesion. Um, and it's basically a pool of blood. It's just hyperplastic vessels and dilated vessels. So there's a lot of blood in the lesion. There's no risk for it to become a, a malignant lesion. So it's always a benign one. And it's usually asymptomatic. So you really um, just see it because you've done an imaging for other reason. Much more frequent in female. And actually a lot of these lesions are more frequent in females. We do not know if it's because of estrogens in this case. Um, and MRI is pretty sensitive and specific for diagnosis. So you do not need a biopsy. And actually if you biopsy, you're gonna cause bleeding. So you don't wanna do that. The nice thing about hemangioma is that it never bleeds spontaneously. So if the lesion does bleed, then you have to suspect something else is brewing. Um, then you can have a solid lesion. And in terms of solid lesion, you always need to kind of find out more because they might be cancer. So you always do a CT with a triple phase or uh, an MRI. And you are looking for basically um, a central scar. So if you find a central scar, then your most likely diagnosis will be uh, focal nodular hyperplasia. And um, this is actually the second most common lesion. So very common, it's benign, never goes into a malignant lesion. It's also more frequent in the female than male, but not really associated with estrogen and has a very nice star or spoke wheel uh, appearance because probably there's a lesion that happens here in the liver parenchyma that triggers the formation of the scar and then the hyperplasia all around it. Um, the problem with the focal uh, nodal hyperplasia is that it's difficult to differentiate sometimes from the adenoma and that's important to differentiate. So you might need a biopsy uh, sometimes. So if there's no central scar, um, the most frequent lesion is actually the hepatocellular adenoma. And the problem with this is that even if it's benign, there's a high risk of going into malignancy. Maybe not a high risk, but it's actually a risk. So the adenomas are usually symptomatic. So most, most likely the patient will have something, abdominal pain, fullness, something that tells you that there's something going on in the liver or at least in the abdomen. So you will do imaging. Um, and it's more frequent in female because it's associated with estrogen. Um, it's also associated with uh, androgen, like for example, um, steroids or any type of like anabolic steroid. And um, another risk factor is metabolic syndrome. So patients are obese. The problem with this is that it can actually bleed spontaneously or it can evolve into hepatic cancer, especially in males. 
So when you diagnose an adenoma, you most likely will need a biopsy to be 100% sure. And then if the adenoma is small, less than five centimeters, you just do surveillance. If it's a bigger one, more than five, then you need to resect it. Okay, lastly, cysts. So cysts, ultrasound will help you a lot. And as any other organ, we need always to see if the cyst is a simple cyst. So there's no loculation classification. It's a very simple anechoic one. Then we're fine. Simple cysts do not need anything. They're benign, very frequent, usually asymptomatic. So unless they're huge and they need drainage, nothing to do and we're good, no follow-up. If it's a complex cyst, so if there's anything like gas, loculation classification, then the first question you ask yourself, is the patient infected? Anything, fever, risk factor for infection, bacteremia. If your answer is yes, then you will think about an abscess or a high diabetic cyst. And the nice thing about high diabetic cysts is that they're calcified and they have a lot of smaller cysts inside. So imaging can help you in the diagnosis. If the answer is no, then again, you need e imaging. So a triple phase CAT scan or MRI, because that might be cancer, maybe hepatic cancer that looks like a cyst because of necrosis. And there are other types that are not really that important for us, like uh, biliary cyst adenomas and cyst adenocarcinomas that need to be resected. So that's just an overview. Uh, sorry if it was messy, uh, but just for you guys to have an idea of what happens when you have a liver lesion. Um, and why do these things all of a sudden start hurting when they haven't hurt before? So like, it might, oh. Not, I'm not asking you. Oh, sorry. So here's a guy who probably, if he ends up having something in his liver, he hasn't had pain, hasn't had pain, and all of a sudden one day, oh my God, it's excruciating, comes to the doctor. Why in a lot of these things do they get pain? Yeah, right. They usually bleed into it, whether it got a little necrosed, it ate through a vessel or something else like that. It's not usually that it just got so big, it starts compressing, but it swelled up a little bit, started compressing the capsule, and that's why they get pain. So very good. And cysts do that, lesion, like solid lesions do that when they overgrow their blood supply, et cetera. So very good. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no. I was very long, so sorry, guys. I uh, hope it wasn't too boring. But Jen, you can take the stage again. I'm just they just make one point that um, a very nice summary, but my focus for the malignancy would be hepatitis B, because that's at higher risk to turn into carcinoma than hepatitis C. So the teaching point is just really hepatitis B more concerned for malignancy progression than hep C, and especially if they have cirrhosis. And, and that's the one that you really should be doing an ultrasound at least every six months or the poor man's alpha fetal protein, which is what I still do, is monitor the alpha fetal protein. So that was the teaching point I just wanted to make, but nice summary and, and not long out And many people recommend doing them every six months alternating, right? So you're doing something every six months, ultrasound, alpha fetal protein, et cetera. But this guy was happy negative, we already know. Yeah. Okay, you, you, can, you can stop my sharing and you can share yours. I think I shared the wrong screen. I'll just share it again. Okay, we see it. Okay. Okay. Oh, we went over the differential diagnosis regarding liver masses. Um, talk about his ED course. So, uh, in the ED, he received antibiotic treatment for his sepsis and also sent his blood cultures. And overnight, he was getting worse in terms of oxygenation, so we escalated to BiPAP, and, but still he was tachypneic with a respiratory rate of over 30. And then he was brought to recess uh, because of hypotension with ICU at bedside. He was, um, he was hypotensive to maps of 40 and uh, need to be on liver fed through crash femoral central line. And also he continued to be altered intermittently trying to remove his BiPAP mask. And he received two liters of IVF. And uh, in the ED, he was intubated because of acute hypoxic respiratory failure and also for airway protection due to altered mental status. So he was brought to the ICU for continued management. Okay. 
and for his for the rest of his inpatient workup, uh, he was continued to receive antibiotics. His white count gradually went down within normal limit during the first week of admission, and his total bilirubin and direct bilirubin went down to a normal limit as well. AST ALT trended down back to normal, and creatinine went down to normal. Uh, we checked his TSH because as he had a history of hypothyroidism. It was 5.028 mildly elevated. For his other workouts, the microbiology studies, and his blood culture, two sets of blood culture came back positive for two organisms, Klebsiella oxytoca and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And they were both sensitive to ceftriaxone. So we switched his antibiotics uh, from broad spectrum to ceftriaxone. And uh, his respiratory culture, uh, two sets of respiratory cultures at different times, one came back positive for MSSA and the, the other one came back positive for pseudonoma aeruginosa that was susceptible, susceptible to levaquin. So he got seven day course for that. And uh, we also did an MRCP per GI's recommendation so his liver lesions turn out to be multiple undrainable microabscesses versus septic emboli in the dependent portion of the right hepatic lobe. And for his biliary system, no biliary ductal dilatation, common bile duct measure was six, uh, 0 0.6 centimeters and there was no cholecholithiasis. And his gallbladder had gallstones, but there was no gallbladder wall thickening and his pancreas was normal without any mass or duct, duct dilatation. And the finding also uh, suggests right main portal vein thrombus. For other workups, uh, including TTE, uh, the ejection fraction is 65% and uh, the right ventricle was normal in size, but uh, it was hypokinetic. There was mild tricuspid uh, regurgitation and um, moderate pulmonary hypertension. And he has a positive DVT in the right common femoral, femoral vein. And there was concern of pulmonary uh, of PE as well, just given that there's possible RV stray from his echo. So he, but he didn't get any, um, uh, he didn't get any CT NGO to, to actually work out for the PE because of uh, his kidney function back then but he received a uh, systemic anticoagulation with uh, Eliquis. And his rest of the hospital course, uh, his IC, so uh, after the MRCP showed multiple non-drainable microabscesses, um, GI uh, would consider that um, the microabscesses was due to a cholangitis event secondary to a CBD stone that's already passed. And he continued to receive cyrox of Traxone and the ID was consulted for management. He was also started on Flagel and uh, he will complete uh, six weeks of antibiotics with Flagel and the third generation cephalosporin and will be discharged with cephalodoxin as oral antibiotics. And uh, his ICU stay also was complicated with uh, ARDS, proximal DVT, paralytic ileus, MSA, pseudomonotracheitis, and also critical illness myopathy. And during the hospital stay, most of his active issues had resolved. And um, besides the prolonged course of antibiotics, he will continue to receive prolonged physical therapy uh, in acute rehab. So he was discharged with um, antibiotics and aliquis, the rest of his home medications. And now he's receiving physical therapy at a rehab facility. His mental status returned to his baseline? Yeah, his mental status returned to his baseline. He was very lethargic, but uh, he was uh, conversive and AL times three. Okay. Uh, so for the illness script, uh, I would look, like to talk about pyogenic liver abscess. And for its prevalence, it was most common type of abscess within an intraabdominal organ. And the risk factors for this condition includes diabetes mellitus, fatty liver disease, underlying hepatobiliary or pancreatic disease, regular use of PPI, liver transplant, and CGD. 
and the pathogenesis, and it's usually secondary to portal vein pyemia, pyemia secondary to bowel leakage, and peritonitis. And also, it could be caused by hematogenous seeding from the systemic circulation. Also, it could cause by direct spread from biliary infection, gallstone, or malignant obstruction, likely for this patient, and also surgical or penetrating wounds. And the signs and symptoms include fever, usually right upper quadrant abdominal pain, jaundice, and hepatomegaly, and which is consistent with this patient's presentation. And labs include elevated alphas, bilirubin, and liver enzymes, leukocytosis, hypoalbuminemia, and anemia. Also, um, our patient presented with the same labs as well. For microbiology, it was most commonly caused by uh, enter enteric gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, or Klebsiella pneumonia in particular. So our patient also has positive uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. It could also be caused by anaerobes, gram-positive bacteria, including Staph aureus, Streptococcus species, and Prococcus. And for immunocompromised patients, they could have Candida species. Uh, pyogenic liver abscess. And the treatment is usually uh, depending on whether it's drainable or not. So if the abscess is drainable, it's usually need to be single in inocular abscess with a diameter less than five centimeters. We would go with percutaneous drainage with catheter placement or needle aspiration. But if it's larger, and also single, single unilocular abscess, we need to go with percutaneous drainage with catheter replacement preferred uh, instead of needle aspiration. And if there are multiple or multiloculated abscesses like this patient, uh, we need to, um, the clinical decision need to be based on individual basis. So this patient would not drain because he had multiple um, very small microabscesses. And the treatment is usually antibiotics that um, we need to empirically cover streptococci, enterotic gram-negative bacteria, and also anaerobes. Uh, so for this patient, we used a third generation of cephalosporin initially through IV ceftriaxone, then switched to oral cephalopodoxium uh, plus metronidazole for six weeks in total. And the other antibiotics uh, include in this, uh, in this chart. Um, and the treatment duration is, is usually prolonged for patient who didn't have complete drainage or who didn't have drainage at all, need to be, with the four, need to be between four to six weeks. And if the patient had drainage and had good response to it, the antibiotics course can be reduced to two to four weeks. And uh, as far as follow-up, and follow-up imaging is usually not warranted only if in the setting of persistent clinical symptoms or the drainage did not go as well as expected because uh, the, um, the, the abscess doesn't resolve that fast for imaging. So it's difficult to use it as an assessment. And also in some studies that mainly conducted in Asian countries, uh, when the study results showed that uh, we need to consider the possibility of occult colorectal cancer in patients diagnosed with uh, pyogenic liver abscess, uh, particularly due to Klebsiella pneumonia uh, in the absence of apparent underlying hepatobiliary disease. Um, but so far, we're not entirely sure about the externality of the study. And we don't know if we can use that uh, information in countries outside of Asia. And uh, also talk about the pyogenic liver abscess versus amoebic liver abscess. Uh, for pyogenic liver abscess, it usually presents in a more aggressive way. And it's more common in older adult. And for amoebic liver abscess, usually in patients who are younger. And for pyogenic liver abscess, it could happen to both men and women. But for amoebic liver abscess, it usually happens to men, to male patients. And uh, in terms of labs for patients with pyogenic liver abscess, it usually has an elevated white count. Well, maybe the liver abscess, it doesn't present with leukocytosis commonly. And for pyogenic liver abscess, 
usually has love elevated a serum bilirubin concentration, but for a patient with a mimic lab, liver abscess, it doesn't have that as well. And uh, for a patient with pyogenic liver abscess, he has a prior history of gallstones or risk factors like diabetes mellitus. And for a patient with a mimic liver abscess, they usually have uh, exposure to uh, endemic regions. And um, if there's time, we could go over this um, graphs. So, but, um, quickly go over it, otherwise. I'll go over it when the video is uploaded so you can review the image. And this is for jaundice as well. Just for sake of time, I'll just uh, skip through these. So the take home points. So um, I think the first thing is that we need to put pyogenic liver abscess in the higher rank of differential list when patients present with a fever, red heart or quadrant pain, and jaundice. And um, the second take home point would be um, when it comes to liver abscess, we need to consider pyogenic versus amoebic, uh, like the points that we discussed before. Pyogenic liver abscess patients usually have a more aggressive presentation. And for the treatment, besides drainage, um, they usually need to be on prolonged course of antibiotics. For our patient, he needed six weeks of antibiotics. And that would be all. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Um, anyone has any questions, comments? I think I was just going to add that, again, great summary, and I put the, the colorectal uh, cancer risk, but just two different things in terms of the antibiotic choice, like cefepime and flagyl is reasonable. Um, the reason we use cefepime here is more for uh, pseudomonal coverage and resistance. So Zosin would have been reasonable as well. Uh, it's just that Zosin, if you were thinking about pseudomonas issue concern, um, then there's more resistance in our institutions. And then the other teaching point is for Klebsiella. There's also a concern, depending on where the patient's coming from, uh, for multi-drug resistance. So it's then also low threshold to think about our carbopenem in that situation. So like the first 24, 48 hours matter in these issues because you need to escalate to a carbopenem as well when you're concerned about MDR, depending. So that's just another teaching point in terms of case reports that you see. Thanks. Thanks. And actually, I was reading, I don't know if that's true, that even if you isolate the, the cause, you still do anaerobic treatment because you don't know uh, from the culture if there's also an anaerobic that. Yeah. Yes. I would, if I always touch the fellows, if this was my mom and dad, what would you do? Would you remove the flagell or not? No. <laughs> so, so yes. <laughs> and then duration, as I tell the patients on consults is, that this is still a journey, that it's going to be at least six to eight weeks, but it just depends on imaging and the next follow-ups and how repeat CAT scans and, uh, and stuff are looked at. And when the drain gets removed for those who get drains in. So but it's Dr. at least Sorry, six weeks. It's 4 p.m. Some, I assume there's some evidence to that as opposed to just treating your mother? About uh, there is some, uh, depending on the question, there is some, and it's and depending on um, COVID, no, there isn't. But <laughs> but yes, there, there is some, depending on the, the clinical question, yes. On this case, yes, there is some. Okay. And that's more, that's going to be more micro and rat and stuff like that. But in the end, that when there is a question, is it seven to 10 days? Sometimes we go by that. Honesty. Um. I was just going to say, you know, for me in this case, um, I, I think GI summarized beautifully as, as you noted, you know, because this was a case of some kind of distal obstruction of the CBD so that even though initially on your ultrasound or your CT, you weren't seeing that, you had all the chemical markers, you know, you had an elevated direct hyperbilirubinemia alpha's, you had a very elevated lipase. So it was some kind of a CBD stone that essentially caused an obstruction and ascending cholangitis, which has a phenomenally high mortality. Um, and even though, yes, we found these like liver abscesses, I think the process really was, you know, these gallstones causing this sort of transient obstruction, which was caught chemically, but not on imaging. And even that night, like if after this person is um, in the recess, et cetera, I would, have, I would have sent for an MRCP because that's basically where kind of, sort of the meat of the situation was and an urgent ERCP perhaps if, if something was obstructed. 
um, you know, it's not one of those like um, more esoteric club CLL liver abscesses uh, that you read about in case reports from Taiwan. It's like a pretty classic, like ascending cholangitis picture. I think it's, I think, yeah, I agree absolutely. Like when you see the picture in the labs and you're like, okay, this is like a renal penta, that's it. But agree. I, and I think um, GI was involved, right, Jin? I remember this case. I think they're either were at West or Morningside, but I think they were, they decided not to, Jen. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, initially, we, we consulted GI, I think. Uh, to, during initial presentation, they were consulted, and there was a plan to do ERCP because the, the presentation was uh, very close to. Uh, there's definitely um, obstruction, and but um, back then he was hemodynamically unstable, so it was postponed. And for his labs, he was they were gradually improving, so it seems that the, the obstruction was relieved. So their plan was to do MRCP instead of ERCP. And uh, it turned out it turned out to be a microabscesses instead of a colloidal colothiasis. So they assumed that um, the microabscesses were caused by um, a stone that was or, that was already passed instead of an active obstruction. Thank you, Jin.